customer. I am recording at home um, because my office is really noisy, but I have cats, and they haven't figured out that I'm home yet, but at some point they might. So you may hear a little bit of meowing in the background. I promise you they have food. They just want attention. So um, hopefully they are asleep in the back room when they stay asleep. Um, but let me go ahead and get sharing, and we will get going. Okay, so just like Taylor said, um, today I'm going to be talking about integrated pest management, and this is a fairly complicated topic, which I'm going to try to just give a brief introduction to um, in today's webinar. My information and email address is right here, so if you have any questions later on, or if you come across, say, like an interesting insect or something that you want help identifying, feel free to shoot me an email. I'm more than willing to um, answer any questions that anyone has with regards to insect pests or integrated mes pest management. Um, I can help with weeds and diseases. I'm just not as good as them, at them as I am with insects. So what is integrated pest management, which I'm going to refer to as IPM for the rest of this um, webinar. So it's a knowledge-based decision-making process in which the selection, integration, and implementation of pest control tactics and management strategies are based on predicted economical, ecological, and social consequences. So that is a really, really scientific way of saying that this is a process that we use to control and manage uh, pests, basically. The key thing here is that it's based off of knowledge, so it's not just like it's the third Friday of every month, so I'm going to spray. Um, You've got this balance of managing, so preemptive actions, as well as post-active, which would be control tactics. And then you're balancing out this idea of economics, ecology, and social consequences. So what is the best for your wallet, what's the best for the environment, and what's the best for sort of your social environment? So for instance, if you're a farmer selling at a farmer's market, your customers get a possibility to be more direct with you than someone who's selling wholesale. wholesale. So you might need to modify your integrated pest management plan to kind of accommodate the fact that your customers can ask you questions and want very distinct things. Um, the idea behind most of these control and management strategies is that we focus a lot on things like cultural and sanitation practices, physical control, biocontrol, and do the very least amount of chemical control we can. And this is mainly because chemical control costs more money than a lot of these other ones. It's not, it's the least uh, environmentally friendly for most of these. And it's the one that in general, um, customers and, and society kind of frowns upon. So it's this general idea of let's do lots of these proactive things and very little of this post-active if we can avoid it. So when you guys think of IPM, I want you to think of it in two different ways. So the first way you can think of it is though is a band. So here is a picture of a band, and in the band we have four different members, and each one plays a different instrument. And individually they can make something that sounds neat. But when you combine all four together, it makes a much better sound. It makes a whole complete song to it. And that's kind of what you do in integrated pest management. So it's, you know, well, this control tactic might knock this pest down by 10%, and this other one might take it down by 10%, and this other one might take it down by 5 and then I've controlled it to the point where it's not financially harming me anymore. So it's this idea of different pieces can come together to complete um, a management strategy. The other way I want you guys to think about this is though it's a toolbox. So... In a toolbox, you have a whole wide variety of tools, but you're going to pick and choose what tool works for this job. So what works on your farm in your tomato fields may not work in your corn and soybean fields. Or what works on the eastern shore of Maryland may not work on the western side of Maryland or in Virginia or someplace else. What works on your farm may not work on someone else's farm. So Or year to year, this might change. So the idea is that you can grab the things that work out of the toolbox and leave the rest, but they're always there so you could use them potentially if you wanted to. 
So when I start talking about control tactics, you might say, well, that's not going to work on my farm because I've got, you know, too many acres, or that's not practical, or I can't do that. And that's okay. Um, the idea is that you can kind of start thinking about how you can use these kinds of thought processes to make a more diverse kind of control management plan rather than just relying on, oh, I found a pest, I need to spray. So, and here's a list of the control tactics that I'm kind of talking about. So again, we want to focus mainly on the bottom things, so things like prevention, control and sanitation, and then if need be, things like mechanical and physical controls. Um, genetic controls are now an option in a lot of places. You always want to include some biological control and then the least amount of that chemical control. And again, this is going to help your, your bottom line as well because on top of the price of the chemicals, you've got your fuel and your time management and all of that. So um, no one really likes using chemicals. If we can avoid them, we all would. So, um, But sometimes you can't and that is a part in integrated pest management as well. Okay. So before I go too far, I want to sort of just lay out a baseline of what I'm talking about when I say a pest. Um, so a pest is any living organism that causes economical significant damage to a crop. Um, and in this case, your crop is whatever you are making money off of. If this was uh, a homeowner, or if you are a homeowner who likes to garden as well, your crop could be, you know, the aesthetic thing that you're enjoying. So you could still use these kinds of concepts there. But since this is more for farmers, we're going to gear this specifically on a crop. Now, if you do cut flowers, the flowers are your crop. So don't necessarily think of it as strictly being a, like, produce, vegetable, fruit, um, soybean, corn kind of thing. Like, this can have a wider thing. Um, this would include anything from insect pests to weeds, mites, nematodes, bacteria, fungus, viruses, and then our furry little friends. Um, you know, I feel like if I surveyed farmers what their number one pest is, I'm pretty sure deer would come up on number one on basically everybody's list. Um, but the idea here is that these organisms are causing a significant amount of damage to your crop. Now, in the case of something like a weed, that could be them out competing with your main crop or them taking up um, more resources. So it's depleting your crop's ability to get sunlight or to get nitrogen or phosphorus or even space. So it's still there, even though it may not be causing like physical damage to the leaves or making it so that the fruit's not harvestable. So think of this in sort of the anything that's causing that kind of financial damage to your crop. Okay, so here's kind of the key steps to integrated pest management. And I do want to point out that this is not sort of like a straight line as much as it's a cycle. So you're constantly going to continuously do this. So the first thing is just to prevent problems from happening in the first place. And then you're going to want to inspect and monitor. Um, this way, if a problem does arise, you can catch it early. Um, part of this is being able to diagnose, and we'll touch a little bit of about diagnosing later on, but that ideally could be its entire own webinar, which at some point either I or maybe someone else might be able to do. Um, you would then take an action if necessary, and this is going to be based off of thresholds that are pre-established either from your own personal knowledge or there's several that can be found online. And then once you've taken an action, you're going to evaluate whether or not that action was useful or not, and then continue to monitor to see if you need to take further action or not. So I'm going to kind of go through each one of these steps a little bit more in detail. So preventing plant problems. So healthy plants have fewer problems right off the bat. So this is one that kind of right plant in the right place at the right time, planted the right way, comes into key. So if you notice, um, for the pictures here, I have two different plants. So one is Brussels sprouts and the other is pineapple. Theoretically, temperature and climate-wise, both of these could be grown here in the state of Maryland. One of them definitely grows better, which would be Brussels sprouts. If you grow pineapples here in Maryland, you're never going to get like a good-sized pineapple. Our winter comes a little too, um, little too quick for them. We just aren't quite warm enough. You could, but you're always going to struggle with it. Um, now, I know a lot of people that say, well, Brussels sprouts don't really grow really well where I live either, and that's very true. You tend to, they're also a very finicky crop. So if you've got the right soil for them, 
they will grow prevalent and you will have a great harvest of them. If you do not have the right soil for them, they will not. So this is where that kind of going back and thinking about what your farm's like, what your soil's like, and picking a crop that's appropriate for it and just sort of reducing a lot of those hassles right off the bat. Um, when we talk about best management practices, that comes down to, you know, water and water use. You know, how much, you know, what's your ability to give them water? How much water are they going to need in the event that you're, you know, how often does your field flood? Now, these past few years, we've had a lot more of that, but where are the problem areas? Um, what are the nutrients and soil requirements for this plant? Um, don't disregard pH or soil type. I had a person recently call me who had ordered um, an acre's worth of blueberry bushes because she really, really wanted to do blueberries and then do jams and jellies with them, only to find out that she hadn't adjusted the pH in her soil. Blueberries like it acidic. She had a, a fairly alkaline soil, actually. So here she has all these plants coming in and basically no way to really quickly adjust her soil. So it's going to take her a few years before she actually gets an, a harvest off of them which if she would have taken some time to do ahead of time, wouldn't have worked. So, and then climate and temperature, um, as much as it would be amazing if you could grow, you know, pineapple and bananas and all these tropical fruits here on the eastern shore of Maryland or in Maryland in general, you really can't. So it's best just to not try. Um, I mean, you could try, but just don't depend on making a lot of money off of them. Okay, so being able to recognize and know the issues in your area comes in really key here. Um, you know your fields, so know where your wet spots are, know where your dry spots are, know where you know, you've got pockets of sand or clay or what have you, because these will be areas that you know will be a little bit more troublesome, so areas to focus on a little bit more. Understanding your crop and what's acceptable amounts of damage for it versus what's not will also help. Um, I can't tell you how many homeowners I caught calling in talking about their tomato plants browning like midsummer like this without realizing that that's just something that tomato plants naturally will do. Um, so just having some sort of understanding will save yourself a lot of like, oh my God, is this an issue? Oh my God, what do I do? Well, if you take some time during the winter months to really research and understand it, you're good. Um, Along with that, if you know right off the bat what are some of the key insect pests or, you know, nematode pests, diseases, you know, take the time to do all that research so that you kind of know when you, if you know what you're looking for, then it's easier to sort of find it. Or when you find a problem with your plant, you can say, oh, this is that disease I heard about. This is how I need to treat for it. Um, and always, always, always try to keep records of this. I know paperwork is the last thing anyone really wants to do. None of us really like it, but it comes in really handy when you're trying to re, when you're trying to evaluate, um, you know, how well things did and whether or not it's worth do repeating them again if that same issue arises or whether or not even that crop is worth growing again. Um, I know there are some farmers that have planted things and then within two years, ripped out entire fields of, you know, fruit trees or so forth just because they realized this wasn't going to produce any real money for them or it was too much of a headache or something like that. So um, monitoring. So monitoring is basically a system of regularly inspecting for insects, diseases, weeds, or environmental factors that can affect your plant's health. So, you know, you can do this visually just as you walk throughout your field. You can set up some traps. Um, you can keep track of, you know, a rain gauge to tell you how much w rain you're getting, whether or not you need to run irrigation more or less. Um, record keeping is also really good, particularly if you're doing um, temperature wise for certain pests will start appearing more when, you know, when we hit a certain temperature scope. So that's something to be wary of. Um, the other thing to be conscious of is when you are inspecting is to keep an eye out for your biocontrol as well as your pest. So if we, oh, let me get a bigger pointer lens here. There we go. So if we were to flip over a plant leaf and we were to see something like these aphids and ants, we know that these ants aren't really doing anything great biologically. Um, and neither are the woolly aphids. Um, 
So this would be something where you'd want to control. If you flipped over that same leaf and you found this ladybird beetle larvae, this thing loves eating aphids. So I can guarantee you by the end of the day, this whole leaf will probably, most of these aphids will be dead because this thing would have just powered through eating them all. Um, so that's one of those things where you say, okay, I found this pest. It was kind of high, but I found some biocontrol. Let me give it a day and come back and take a look at it or give it two days and see if when I come back, if the numbers are lower. You can also set up things like this. So this is a pheromone trap, um, and this is specifically used for moths. So what you do is you put a kill strip and a pheromone up on the top, and then when the moths start uh, immigrating up from um, the south, because they tend to overwinter in the south parts of the United States up into our area in the Mid-Atlantic, when they start coming up, you'll end up catching them. And when you catch a certain amount in a night, you can say, okay, the possibility of them being in my cornfield is more likely. So now I'm going to take, you know, a proactive spray, a proactive approach and maybe spray something, or I'm going to go out and look in some husks and see if they're here or not. So it's another way, especially if you are doing something like corn where you're planting large acres of it, you're not going to really be able to visually inspect every single one the way you might like if you were a small scale farmer. Um, so things like this work really well for monitoring. So again, diagnosing accurately is really important, but it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of time to get really good at it. I'm fairly good at diagnosing insects. I am not particularly good at diagnosing diseases and that's okay. Um, if you know, finding resources and great places that you can use to get that information. Obviously, extension is great. We have, you know, the plant disease diagnostic lab that you can always send stuff to. If you think it's a disease and they can help you narrow it down, you know, you can send insect pictures to any of us or weed samples in and we're all really happy to help you. Um, I think a lot of people always jump to whenever they find problems with their plants. And with their crops, they always assume it's something living. It's a disease. It's an insect. It's, you know, something like that. And a lot of people forget that the non-living um, abiotical factors can cause just as much. And, in fact, oh, about 50-50 on average is what we find. So things like too much water, not enough wet water, um, too hot, too cold, uh, nutrient deficiency, all that stuff comes into play, too. Um, and the key thing I like to tell people when you're really trying to narrow it down is to look for patterns. Um, living things very rarely happen in straight lines versus anything that's man-made always happens. We tend to like straight lines. So if you notice an entire row of your crop is damaged, then that might be something like your spreader didn't spread fertilizer properly or it may have over fertilized or that's one with something like, you know, a deer may have come and just browsed that whole thing. So like, uh, insects and diseases don't tend to do straight lines, per se, um, so look for patterns. Take action if necessary. So can you control it physically? Um, can this be hand removed? Can this be tilled under? Um, can this one plant just be removed? Is it possible? Um, if not, is there any biocontrol there? Do you have ladybird beetles there? Do you have prayer mantises there? You know, do you have some way of controlling it biologically? If not, chemical control is probably going to be your only option. Um, has it reached that action threshold? And then what's the least toxic chemical that will do the job for you? And be effective because it's not worth, it's better to spray a chemical that's effective than to have to spray multiple ones that are not effective. Okay, so when I talk about action threshold, what we're talking about is something um, that refers to the economical injury level and the economical threshold. So the economical injury level is when the damage due to this pest is equal to the cost of controlling it. So if this was an insect pest, it would be when it, it's feeding or causing damage is equal to the cost of, um, you know, of the chemical and the fuel for you to apply it and your time. If this was something like a weed, it, you know, is it growing and outshadowing and outcompeting enough that it's reducing your yields on your crops? Um, the only time that this doesn't really work is a lot of times when it comes to diseases because you have to be proactive with the disease. But then it's that, okay, how likely will this disease 
be in my field and how much will it reduce either my yields or my profit with regards to quality and quantity. So that's sort of the balancing act of all of this. So the economical injury level is this top blue line here. So this is one you can justify the cost of it. And if you don't, your pest population goes out of control. The economical threshold is where you actually want to treat. So this is a slightly lower than that injury level, but the idea is that your pest population will have some sort of delay after you've applied. It will take a, an hour or so or a day or so before your pest population actually starts to drop down. So you don't want it going over this economical thing. So you're going to treat right before it hits it. So when people talk about a threshold, this is what they're talking about. Um, most Common insect pests, you can find this threshold someplace on an extension website or in um, a grower's manual. If not, you can contact your local extension office and we can try to help you find one. This is also where, for instance, if you do record keeping, you can say, well, I noticed last year when I had one hornworm on a tomato plant, my tomato plant outgrew the feeding damage of it. But when I had five, I really noticed a yield loss. So maybe my threshold is somewhere between one and five. So maybe I can, you know, two or three might be when I want to start treating. Um, okay, so again, after you do any kind of treatment, whether it's the physical or it's biological or chemical, you always want to monitor afterwards. You want to make sure it worked because if it didn't work, then you still have a problem out in your field and you need to resolve it. After you've done it, you always need to record. If it's a chemical, you have to have logs according to MDA already. So it can be as simple as going back and putting a note with, you know, next to whatever you sprayed, yes, this worked, no, it didn't work, um, which would be evaluating. So after you've made this action move, a few days later, go back out, evaluate. Did it work? Did it not work? And then through this repeated method, you'll eventually kind of learn what works on your farm, what works with your crops, what works in your time schedule, what works for you. And again, remember, this is like a toolbox. So what works for me may not work for you and it may not work for your neighbor. So the idea here is to really learn for your own sake um, and on your own property. Um, so I guess I'm, does anyone have any questions about any of that before I go on to control tactics? I'm gonna open back up web, no. Okay. Are there any questions? I don't know where WebEx went. Okay. I'm not hearing Taylor jumping in, so I'm going to assume that there were no questions. No, there aren't any questions yet, Emily. Okay, cool. Then I'm going to just keep going with control tactics. Um, so again, if it seems like I'm repeating something, that's because this is super important. Um, so again, here's our IPM control tactics triangle. So we want to do a lot of the bottom and very little of the top um, because the bottom stuff tends to be cheaper and uh, it's you know more proactive. So you can do it or start thinking about it during the off season versus having to dam deal with sort of damage that's happening right then and there. So, okay. So prevention is, again, that idea, healthy plants view a problem. So that's kind of setting up your farm and your growing methods to have the least amount of problems from the beginning. So this can be things like, you know, having raised beds with plastic mulch on them or a dying living mulch. This is things like making sure your plants are spaced properly and that you're planting them at the right time. So not too early in the season that they'll get frost damage, not too late in the season while they'll be stressed out because they haven't established roots before summertime, um, rotating them out. So, you know, if you are having some soil disease issues, uh, you know, don't put tomatoes after tomatoes after tomatoes. Likewise, don't use the same families. So don't follow tomato with peppers and then eggplants and then tomatoes. They're all solanaceous. They all get the same kinds of diseases. So maybe switch them with a tomato and then a cucurbit and then sweet corn. Or, you know, this is that traditional um, sweet corn, soybean, wheat kind of rotation. That's, you know, constantly rotate them through. 
you can always get resistant plants nowadays. Um, so the handful of GMOs that are out there are options, but you can also get ones that have just been bred for resistance. So all of these tomato plants up here were all options um, that are resistant to at least one or two different types of diseases. There's also nowadays people can, you can get grafted plants. Um, the grafted ones tend to be more costly, but you, what you basically have is a root stock that is resistant to a lot of root pathogens, and then they can graft on any type of tomato that you'd want to it. So this is really good when it comes to someone who, for instance, if you want to grow heirlooms, um, the heirlooms don't necessarily have a lot of disease resistance, disease resistance to them. So by grafting them together, you get really good heirlooms without having to worry about diseases coming through mid-season and killing off all of your crops. Um, this is also really common in a lot of cucurbits. Um, the south uses water, like grafted watermelons are really common down in, in the southern states. Um, not so much here, but I think it, it's eventually going to catch on up here at some point if disease ends up becoming a bigger and bigger issue. So cultural and sanitation practices, um, and this is not a complete list by any means, guys. So if you're saying like, oh, I did this, this, and this on my farm, but she didn't list it, that's okay. I just kind of want to hit the big ones that most people are probably doing or would be easier for people to sort of start doing. So one is straight up just field sanitation. So cleaning your equipment, um, particularly when you're moving between fields to fields, um, it's tedious. I know the last thing you want to do is drive back someplace and spend 10 to 15 minutes hosing down your tires but if you have a field that's really weedy and it's muddy one day when you're working on it and you go drive to the other field and the mud dries on your tires and falls off you're just moving weed seeds around and particularly now that we have some very noxious resistant weeds mainly things like palmer amethyst and um mare's tail and uh, some of the other ones like the re the if you can reduce the spread of them, you're gonna save yourself so much trouble. Because while it may not be an issue this year, you don't want to have to battle it next year. Um, same thing with like tools. Um, so if you're snipping diseased parts off of a vine or something like that, you want to make sure that you sanitize those tools before you go to cut another part of a plant um, or another plant because you don't want to transfer those spores back and forth. Again, keep those best management practices in mind. Um, you know, uh, I've had people say like, oh, well, I water my crops in the middle of the night so then the water doesn't evaporate. And I go, yeah, but then you're spreading around disease spores and it's sitting on your crop all day or all night long. So that's when diseases can really become an issue. So, you know, the best management practices of watering first thing in the morning or mid-morning so then your, your crop gets it and can use that water when it can actually photosynthesize but then the leaves are dry when it cools down at night will help cut down on your diseases. Um, things like raised beds and the plastic mulching again, right off the bat, um, you're already reducing your weed pressure right around where your crop is growing by having it, just because you're shading out your weeds. You can also prune and thin. This is more useful in things like fruit crops and things like berries, apples, peaches, cherries, all of those things. Again, the idea here is that you're getting good air circulation, um, so you're reducing the likelihood of kind of fungal diseases. Um, you can use things like trap crops for insects um, or interplanting. So down here with the watermelon and the marigolds, um, marigolds are known to have anti-nematicide chemicals in their root systems. So by interplanting your watermelon, which has been known to have nematode issues in sandy soil, um, with marigolds, you can kind of reduce that because the marigold roots will spread out and release this chemical and kind of keep the nematode populations down. Mechanical and physical control. So this is basically either the removal of the plant or part of the plant. Um, so tillage, hoeing, hand picking. Um, if you're small scaled, Things like duct tape works really good for sticking like insect eggs masses off. Obviously, if you're a large scale farmer, that may not be practical for you. So again, take your time um, into consideration when you're evaluating these practices. So you know, is it practical for you to go hand hoe all of this, or is black plastic easier for you? 
you know, is tilling better? Is this, you know, what have you? If you are in a no-till environment, obviously this may not be an option for you, so then you're going to need to rely on something else. Um, creating physical barriers, so um, our four-legged friends, deer, bunnies, all of those, maybe having a fence up, as costly as it is long-term-wise, that may end up paying for itself better, particularly if you are doing a high-scale upper crop, um, something like produce. I wouldn't really recommend putting up a fence for something like corn or soybeans, but if you were doing, you know, a more costly crop, possibly. Um, even something like, so the picture here has two, I think these are squash plants, and one is covered in a clay powder. So if I was an insect gonna, who wanted to feed, I can't feed through that clay. Or that clay makes it so that feeding is really hard for me. So I'm not likely going to feed on this one covered in clay. I'll likely move over to this other one. So if your whole field was covered in clay, it would likely, the insects would either starve or they would move out to try to find more favorable food. Your other option is to use these kind of lone ones as a trop crop. So then you could go through and just treat these non-treated clay ones because that's where your pests are gonna flourish around. Um, you can do things, yeah, so unfavorable to pests or more favorable to biocontrol. Um, so a lot of our predators and our parasitoids and all of those beneficials that we like really have environmental conditions that they like. So the example with the marigolds, parasitoids feed exclusively on pollen and nectar in their adult stage. So by having flowering plants mixed amongst your crops, you're allowing the parasitoids to have a food source for themselves. So then when they're ready to go lay their eggs, they're going to hunt in your crop for a pest to lay their eggs in. This would also increase pollination in your crop, which would in general up your yield. So you might say something like, well, I might have this pest in here, but because of these pollinator flowers, I've increased my yield by 5%, which means I can take 2% of damage from this pest. So it's all kind of a balancing game. So again, no one likes keeping records, but if you keep records, you can kind of figure out the, balance, the checks and balances of doing this kind of stuff. Um, which leads me into biological control, which is probably one of my favorite ones because this is about animals killing all the bad animals. So this is like the superheroes um, of the natural world that's helping us farm. So biological control is the use of predator, predators, like so this predatory mite, think lace wings, ladybird beetles, um, prey mantises. I'm sure I'm not the only one who has seen an abundance of dragonflies this year. A lot of people don't realize this, but adult dragonflies are predatorial. They love feeding on things like small caterpillars, mosquitoes, little flies. So if you find them in your field, that's amazing. That's great. You want them in your field. Um, parasitoids would be like this. Um, they're tiny little wasps and flies that lay their eggs inside of other insects. Um, and then when their eggs hatch, their larvae basically eat all of the internal organs of the other insect, and then they'll come out and pupate on the outside. So each one of these little white things is a baby, or is a kind of a teenage wasp going through puberty, and then it'll hatch out to become an adult wasp that will go kill another caterpillar. This tends to have a slightly more delayed effect, so parasitoids think more long-term control because this caterpillar um, would would still sort of be feeding, but it's definitely going to decrease its feeding habits when it's infected with a parasitoid. And then pathogens would be the use of something like fungals or bacteria to kill um, pests. So in this case, this is a grub. And you can see that this one right here, the light colored one is healthy, and then it slowly gets darker, and then the fungus slowly engulfs it completely. And just like the parasitoid, this fungus will grow on this and then it will release spores that will go into your soil that will control other grubs. So biological control is a really great thing to have in your field and it tends to be really useful as sort of a constant and or long-term control method. So it's not going to necessarily work for like sudden spikes, but if you've got it, it can bring those spikes down back down to manageable things. But it's a good general thing to always have in your field. So along with that line, I like to think of growth regulators and pheromones as kind of something that 
can fit in either bio control or in chemical control because traditionally these are chemicals you buy them from a company but they work with regards to the biological components of insect pests so this isn't necessarily a broad chemical that's going to get sprayed on your field that's going to kill everything what it's something that's going to do is be very specific for a certain type of pest so something like the pheromone trap which is what is here um, this is basically a mating disruptor. So what happens is you put a pheromone in here and all the male insects, normally they're things like beetles or, or moths, um, smell this pheromone and they basically think all the lady insects are here. So they come here and then they get trapped inside and they go, there are no ladies here, um, and they die, surrounded by all their, their bros. Um, meanwhile, all the female moths are out in your field going, I wish I could find someone to mate with so I could lay these eggs, but I can't find any males, so I've lived my life and I died without reproducing, sadly. Um, for them, not so sadly for you because you don't want the pest in your field. So it's basically this mating disruptor. You draw all the males normally to one place and then less females mate, less insects in, out in your field. Um, the growth regulators work kind of afterwards. Um, so this is basically like an insect hormone so think of this as though if you had a baby and then you gave it a bunch of hormones that made it go through puberty um, it disrupts this normal growth cycle so it will either stop them from growing or it will make them rapidly grow which will likely kill them the nice thing about these is they tend to be pretty low in toxicity and they tend to be pretty pest specific and if it's not specific to an individual species, it's to a family or an order. So you could get these and they would only work on say like caterpillars, which would be Lepidopter, but they would be completely harmless to things like beetles and bees and all that. So you could leave all your really good pollinators alone while targeting your pest species. So these are kind of a great middle ground area for them. The pheromone trap is also really good to use for monitoring. So again, thinking back to, you know, if I catch three male moths, I know they're up here, and then I can say, okay, well, that's my threshold, so now I need to spray my field so that I don't get, you know, corn earworm in my sweet corn or something like that. Okay, so chemical control, um, this should be your last resort. You should try to avoid it. Um, again, it's costly to you as a farmer. It takes time to apply, you know, uh, not only are the cost of the chemical, but there's the water, there's the fuel to do it, it's your time, it's hot, no one likes putting on the spraying equipment, like, no one likes doing this. Um, I don't have to tell you guys that. Um, please always remember to follow directions. If you are using chemical control, that label is the law. Um, you always want to do use caution whenever you are. Try to avoid some of the non-target effects. So using things like, you know, on your smaller scale, this gentleman, got the backpack sprayer so he can spot treat if at all possible rather than having to treat a whole field if you've only got one area that's problematic just treat that um, try to avoid things like drift and so forth be conscious of things like pest resistance so um, rotating is really key when it comes to this you don't want whether it's a weed or an insect or anything like that if it becomes resistant to that chemical that chemical is worthless then you can apply as much as you want, but this pest is never going to die from it. It's not going to have an effect. Um, and if that pest then mates with other pests, then next year you're going to have an even harder time doing it. Um, secondary pest outbreaks is when you have a main pest and you do something like apply a chemical and then you kill off your main pest, but you have a second pest that comes up. So the one I like to talk about is aphids. A lot of times people will spray for um, aphids and then after their aphids go away they'll notice that thrips come up um, or something like that. So then it becomes this sort of balancing act of okay what was a pest um, is now or what wasn't made a major pest is now a pest because they, they don't have anyone competing with them for this food anymore. Um, Primary pest resurgence is when your pests come back before your biocontrol comes back. And aphids are another great example of this. Um, if you are, again, out in your field and you're scouting and you find aphids and there's biocontrol, chances are you don't need to treat because your biocontrol is going to work. 
primary pest resurgence would be if you found this and you had ladybird beetles out there, but you sprayed anyways, and you killed off all your ladybird beetles, well, it takes them longer to reproduce and to come back into your field than the aphids. So you'll end up with like this low of aphids and then they'll spike up really high and they'll eventually go down when the ladybird beetles come back, but it takes longer for your predators to get back in there. So just something to be cautious of if you, again, Try to learn what your biocontrol are and be conscious of looking for them as you're looking for your pests as well. Uh, rotate modes of actions for sure. And then the main reason chemicals don't work is they're treating the wrong source. Um, and, you know, if, if your plants are struggling because they've got a fungal disease and you're spraying an insecticide, that's, you know, you're treating the wrong thing. Or if they're turning yellow because they're lacking in a nutrient and you think it's uh, a fungal disease, you're, you're just throwing money away. So you really want to diagnose before you get to that chemical component. The other thing is that there are certain circumstances where you can't spray a chemical after something's happened. So I can spray a chemical on a fungal disease, but it's not going to undo the damage that that fungal disease has done already. It can only be preventative. So there's kind of a checks and balance in this. So that's where things like monitoring your environment to say, okay, I'm likely to have a fungal disease. I need to treat for it. So it's kind of a balancing act. Okay, so here are some tips on how to reduce your impact on pesticides. I'm running a little low on time, so I'm going to go ahead and skip these. Um, but you guys will get a copy of this. So you can always come back and read them, or if you have questions, you can contact me. Um, so with diagnosing, again, this could be a whole different one, so I'm just going to touch the tip of the iceberg here. Um, so when you do have a problem, gather some information. So what type of plant is it on? What species are, are, you know, is it a big strip in your field? Is it just one pocket? Is it half the field? Um, what does it look like? What's the history of the area? And what's the timeline? Did this start happening last week? Has this slowly been happening over the whole season? Um, and so forth. What, what happened around this field too? Um, all this can kind of gather all this information, and with this, you can kind of problem solve and narrow down what might actually be the real problem. So first and foremost, is it a real problem? Is this a long-term real problem, or is this just a short-term? So if you have never seen blossom end rot, that's what's on these tomatoes, and you tend to find it in the first harvest or around the second harvest when calcium starts getting low in the soil. So I've definitely had some new farmers and gardeners call me in and, and send me pictures of this and ask, like, what fungal side do I spray for this? And it's like, well, you don't. You just need to put some more calcium in your soil. And if you pick these tomatoes off um, and you give it some calcium, your next crop will be better. Um, again, look for those patterns. So, you know, if blossom end rot is not likely going to happen on just one of your tomato plants. It's going to likely happen to a whole section of your field. So that can be a clue in there that this isn't biological, this is something environmental. Um, the progression of the damage. So was this something that started in the lower leaves and worked its way up to the upper leaves? Was, did this start at the top of the plant and work its way down? Did it stop, start at one edge of the field and slowly start appealing at the rest of the edge of the field? All of this together again can help you figure out what's happening. Um, avoid association by guilt. Um, insect pests get a lot of heat for certain types of damage when it's just an insect that happens to be on your plant. It may not be causing any damage at all. So here's some examples of living versus non-living factors. So living would be things like your pathogens, diseases, so fungal, bacteria, viruses, insects, mites, and then other animals, be it bunnies, raccoons, bears, deer, humans, all that kind of stuff. Your non-living things are going to be things that are more weather-related, um, temperature, moisture, nutrients, and then phototoxicity, which would be kind of chemical damage. So here's some examples of ones that oh, some people may say one thing or the other. Um, so this first picture here has a nice clean cut on it. So some people would say, oh, well, this could be this or it could be that. This is likely deer or groundhog damage. Whenever you see a nice clean cut like that, um, it's going to be a large mammal that would do that. 
Um, so this picture of this watermelon here, while there is fungal stuff happening on it, the initial problem itself was environmental. It was the sunspot. So, you know, the plant ended up not shading this melon enough. There were some hot days. It got sunburned. It's, the burn itself allowed for rot to take place and make it so that this fruit's no longer marketable. And then you get symptoms like something like wilt. So here's a cucumber plant that's wilted. Um, is it abiotical? Is it biotical? It could be both. It could, um, it's not neither, but you know, this could be a disease. This could be a, a bore that has girdled it. This could be, you know, this one, the drip tape could have broke further up and this one hasn't gotten water for the past two days and it's wilting because of that. Um, so that's where you need to kind of sit back and problem solve when you've got some of these kind of generic looking like ones. So here's some examples of some temperature extremes. So again, sun scold on pepper, curling leaves, wilting um, for too much heat. If you end up getting a plant that kind of droops and has this brownish black look to it, that's potential frost damage. So uh, particularly in spring and fall, this might be a damage that you're more likely to see. And then you could say something like, oh, I saw this. Let me go check the weather and see how cold it got last night. Oh, it's probably frost damage. Um, moisture extremes, so wilting tends to be the big definer for moisture extremes, both when you have not enough water and too much water. So when your plants have too much water, they can't get oxygen in their roots because all of the, the pores in the roots are filled up with water. So then that in return will cause um, the roots to not be able to, to move nutrients and stuff up, and that will cause plants to wilt. So too much water can be just as bad for plants. But chances are, again, um, if you saw this in your field and you say, oh, last night we got lots of rain, it's super muddy, that's what it is, or if your soil is super dry, you could kind of predict that already. Um, nutrient disorders, so these can come in a wide variety of different symptoms. Um, so the picture here just shows tomato plants and all the different nutrients that they're lacking and how they look very distinctly different depending on the one. So, you know, the nitrogen has this golden leaf versus like the zinc's got this more coppery burnt look. Iron has it right near the stem, but not on the tips. Um, so again, uh, taking some time to kind of understand like what your leaves look like, or you can always send pictures to Extension or to the Plant Diagnostic Lab, and we can kind of help you figure out what it is. Um, soil samples, a lot of times, so we're, we'll be a key in this. So if you start seeing stuff like this, a lot of times we'll say, take a soil sample and let's just let someone run it and see what you've got a deficiency in. Uh, pesticide or fertilizer or phototoxicity. So this is damage that's been done due to a chemical. Um, so either drift from a neighbor or maybe you didn't wash out your tanks well enough or something like that. So. A lot of times, again, and it looks very similar to a lot of these nutrient disorders. So this yellowing corrosis in there, the copper kind of burnt look, looks really similar to this. You know, in this case, a lot of people might say like, oh, this was a fungal disease that was earlier on. Well, in this case, um, they went back and went, oh, no, my farmers, you know, my, the person next to me sprayed something about a week ago, and then this appeared, and they're very much droplet-like shapes. So... Same thing here, or the corrosis right around the edges here. Most of the time when it comes to nutrient, it'll be in the middle working its way out. So if it's on the edges like that, it's kind of a giveaway that it might be phototoxicity instead. Um, and then you've got living factors, which again can play things. Normally with living factors, you will see some sort of sign that they were there. Um, so, you know, in the case of this corn, it's a nice clean cut. This was a deer walked through and chomped the tip of each one earlier on, and the corn's grown since then. Insect pests, you normally tend to find the insect itself, or you'll find its poop. Um, so fungal diseases, you tend to find those fruiting bodies there. So this is corn smut, and then this is a, a bacteria disease that's on a leaf. Um, so we're going to kind of just talk about the three pathogens, so viruses, 
uh, bacteria and funguses because these tend to be the ones that people tend to get the most confused about. I will say you can always take advantage of the diagnostic lab as well to help you narrow it down. But when it comes to fungal disorders, um, they tend to be more circular and ring-like because what happens is you've got a fungal spore that's spreading out. So they'll tend to give you these ring-like things. And you can see them on this leaf here. If they're rust-like, you'll also tend to get a bumpy feeling to them underneath the, the leaves or on the top of the leaves, or you'll start seeing those fungal spores. So fuzzy or bumpy like that. The roots themselves will start to color in colors and the plant will end up wilting. So bacteria diseases, these tend to open via wounds or natural openings in the plant. Um, these are a little bit harder because you're never gonna be able to see the bacteria itself the way you can see fungus is. Um, some common symptoms would be things like yellowing and browning. You'll get leaf spots, but they're going to be much more angular. Um, and as soon as they hit a leaf vein, they're going to stop, versus the fungal ones are going to be these nice circular patterns that will cross leaf veins. Um, the plants sometimes will have an oily or wet looking to them, and wilting is a really common thing that happens with bacteria diseases, because what happens is the bacteria fills up the xylem and the phloem, which is what you're seeing right here. Okay, viruses are another one that you can commonly sometimes find. They're not quite as common as bacteria and fungal diseases. Um, these ones aren't transmitted by insects and mites. So your main control tactic for the virus is either to get a resistant plant variety or to control the insect or mites. Um, so they'll end up doing things like stunting your plants or causing distor uh, distortions to the leaves and flowers, so like this. Um, you can also get necrotic leaves or rings um, on both your leaves and your fruit. So here's a case of a virus in tomatoes, and these tomatoes are basically unmarketable in any way, shape, or form. You couldn't even can with them. Um, I'm not even sure if you as a a farmer would even want to take them home and cut them and eat them with rings like that on them. Okay. Um, I am basically out of time and I want to leave some few minutes for questions, but um, if you do need to submit a plant sample, here are some directions on how to do this. All this information is up on our plant diagnostic website, as well as if you're not in Maryland and you're sending your plant samples to a different university, contact them ahead of time before you collect any samples and figure out what they want so that you're not wasting your time and energy collecting things that aren't gonna help them actually solve your problem. Um, for vegetable growers, I highly recommend grabbing a copy of the Mid-Atlantic Commercial Vegetable Guide. This helps immensely when it comes to establishing, it's got lists of thresholds, not only for conventional, but for organic, as well as lists of chemicals that you can use and all sorts of directions. You can download it in a PDF form online for free, or if you're like me and you want a paper copy, um, you can also order paper copies. It's about $25 to $30. Um, there are some other manuals out there for things like corn, soybeans, and the grains. Um, you just have to hunt a little bit more for them, and if you contact me, I can definitely help you track down one for your area. So with that, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. If you come up with any questions, later on or anything specific to your farm, my email address is there and I'm always willing to, to help with this kind of stuff. Thanks, Emily. We'll give everyone a chance to write some questions down. Lots of valuable information in there today. I know it's hard to condense such a big topic, but you did a great job. Thank you. So, there was one question. They um, were asking if there was a list or website um, that they can go to to find out which vegetables should not follow the other. I think it was during your crop rotation. So the the vegetable um, production recommendation guide will have some recommendations on that as well. I would in general recommend that you not follow things that are in the same families. So don't follow solanaceous with solanaceous. So switch between um, the different types of vegetables. 
Um, and the other thing that you can also do is pick ones that um, have different planting and harvesting times. So, so if you have tomatoes this year, maybe put your coal crops, so things like cabbage and broccoli and and stuff like that there, and then switch it with like sweet corn. Um, as and then you could put something like sweet potatoes. Um, so you're you're switching up kind of like when that land's going to be in its prime time, as well as the type of crop that's there. Um, if you have some specific crops that you grow on your farm, feel free to shoot me an email with a list and we can kind of talk about it a little bit more in detail. But I think the Mid-Atlantic Guide does give some recommendations on some basic crop rotations that you can do in there um, as well. And they've, they kind of lay out on like how, how we group these vegetables, but we traditionally group them in kind of like the solanaceous is things like tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants. Sweet corn is its own. And then you've got like your crucible or coal ones, which would be things like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, the, the spring and fall ones basically. And then cucurbits would be like squash, zucchini, melons, all those hollow stem ones would be another grouping. And then I tend to put things like green beans and peas into their own category as well. And they tend to be that like spring to summer jumping stage. Um, and then I'd put things like potatoes um, and root vegetables in a different one as well. So that's kind of how I group them. Um, but I can definitely help you find a resource to, to kind of break it down a little bit more. Very good. And there, um, what's the bug on this slide, Emily? So this is a mole cricket. Um, they are, we occasionally find them up here in Maryland in the Mid-Atlantic. They like really sandy soils. They are not really a pest up here. Down in Florida, they're a major pest, but they're one of my favorite insects. I just think they're really adorable. They like, they're kind of like, they're not pretty, but they're kind of adorable. So I don't know. I this is like my generic ending slide. So, but yeah, if you do find these in your field, um, unless you are growing like a root vegetable, like something like carrots or something like that, you're fine. These guys will feed a little bit on roots, but they also are really good at breaking down like dead leaf matter and stuff like that in your soil. So you'll tend to find them in sandy soil with a good amount of organic matter. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording.